Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the so-called nuclear experts get it wrong. This week, we feature a powerful interview with Steve Simmons, who was on board the USS Ronald Reagan when it sailed to Japan immediately after the earthquake, tsunami, and the beginning of the nuclear disaster on March 11, 2011. He sailed directly into the radiation plume from Fukushima Daiichi, and now you can hear how certain decisions were made aboard the ship, the direct impact this has had on his health, and what it's been like trying to maneuver within government medical systems that do not want to acknowledge that the radiation to which he and his shipmates were exposed had anything to do with the catastrophic health challenges he's been experiencing. That interview, plus Numb Nuts of the Week, and a new Ma Nature report will be coming up in just a few minutes. Today is Tuesday, July 8, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. More leaks at Fukushima Daiichi in Japan, this time from reactor number 5. On July 6th, it was discovered that seawater is leaking from a pipe in reactor 5, and TEPCO had to turn off the cooling system with no idea when it's going to be resumed. TEPCO says the temperature will reach the company's safety limit of 65 degrees Celsius, which is 149 degrees Fahrenheit, within a little more than a week. If the system is not patched up within the next nine days, temperatures are expected to soar, and that means there could be a further meltdown situation. Experts say that one of the most difficult challenges at Fukushima Daiichi is removing the fuel debris. William Magwood of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, but who will, as of September, emerge as the pro-nuclear advocate he's always been when he assumes his new job as Director General of the Paris-based Nuclear Energy Agency, says that during a recent visit to Japan, people have asked him from time to time, are there technologies in the U.S. that can help solve this problem? He said that the reality is that there is no technology that exists anywhere to solve this problem. That's right, nuclear is safe until it isn't. NHK reports that healthcare workers in northeastern Japan are trying to shed light on a quote-unquote silent killer because more than 3,000 people have died in the years since the 2011 earthquake, tsunami, and the start of the nuclear crisis. Kazuma Yonikura Director of the nonprofit health organization Nagumi says, We're still seeing more and more people with physical conditions and diseases. I will keep asking why the client died, what we can do to save a life, and what kind of support is truly needed. Note that he never once said the word radiation. As reported on Iori Mochizuki's great blog, Fukushima Diary, a Twitter post of a Fukushima citizen read, The authorities came to check the radiation levels every few days for three times in total. The readings went up every time they measured. They removed the soil again from where the radiation levels significantly rose up. Decontamination is just a fantasy. Heaps of soil put in bags to be removed for decontamination are piled up right behind a residential street in Fukushima, and some of the bags are reported to be severely deteriorated. There are 140,000 bags in approximately 600 temporary storage areas in Fukushima Prefecture. And originally, the bags were supposed to last only three to five years. It has now been more than three years since the accident began. The Asahi Shimbun reports that TEPCO, the operator of the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, has rejected requests for additional compensation from residents forced to evacuate because of the nuclear disaster. This defies a government mediation center decision. The request made on behalf of the 15,000 residents of Namiya in Fukushima Prefecture, representing 70% of the town's population, was for an additional $492 per month for each evacuee, with an additional $300 for those aged 75 or older. TEPCO rejected the proposal, saying it would offer only an additional $200 per month 
only to residents 75 years or older who have suffered injuries or illnesses. Namia Mayor Tamotsu Baba commented the following day, TEPCO does not understand the pain of victims at all. And now... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that sound awake. Fukushima Prefecture is opening up two swimming beaches this summer without analyzing the beach sand for radiation. Last year... They measured over 3,000 becquerels per kilogram of cesium in both of the beaches. That represents more than 30 times as much as the food safety limit. Not only will they not analyze the sand this year for an unannounced reason, the analysis data from last year was also removed from their website for some reason or another. However, they did analyze the sand of the seafloor and, surprise, They found cesium-134 and 137 in the five samples taken from the two beaches. So if you go to the beach in Fukushima Prefecture, you've got your choice between a sunburn and a radiation burn. And that's why Fukushima Prefectural Government is this week's Numbnuts of the Week. Three Numbnuts adjacent stories this week, all from Fukushima Diary and all dealing with food. Agricultural associations in Fukushima Prefecture have started requesting 200 companies to purchase peaches produced in Fukushima in order to fight harmful rumors against Fukushima peach farmers. The Tokyo Metropolitan Government has started a campaign to get people to drink Tokyo tap water, either straight from the tap or in a bottle. That's despite the fact that the Nuclear Regulatory Authority in Japan has found a greater density of cesium-134 and 137 in tap water in Tokyo than in Miyagi Prefecture, which is right next door to Fukushima. And supermarkets in Tokyo are selling four packs of tomatoes. If they come from Ibaraki, Chiba, or Tochigi prefectures, they cost 200 yen. But if you get those Fukushima tomatoes of the exact same size, they cost half that, just 100 yen. What a bargain! Shoppers agreed because only two packs of Fukushima tomatoes remained on the shelves. In the U.S., the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, site in Carlsbad, New Mexico, has teams of scientists and engineers puzzled as they try to determine exactly what caused a barrel to explode. Despite hundreds of experiments to date, investigators have been unable to create any reaction that would have caused the container to leak as it did. The probe is focused on 16 barrels of highly acidic nitrate salt-bearing waste. That's 10 more barrels than officials said were at risk only a few weeks ago. Five of them are being stored at the Waste Control Specialist site in West Texas, which has them above ground and not in a containment section in an area of the country that is prone to tornadoes. As to increased radiation from WIP, as reported last week, according to Don Hancock of Southwest Research and Information Center, the current data show that there are increased amounts of radioactivity going into the environment as contaminated filters are being changed. DOE presumes that the ventilation system and the exhaust shaft are too contaminated to use in a reopened facility. So on June 18, the House Appropriations Committee approved $20 million as a down payment for a new ventilation and new exhaust shaft. It's very difficult or impossible to determine exactly what happened and how much contamination was released. We'll talk again with Don Hancock next week. And now a new report... Stop, look around you, think, touch, smell, life is all around you, call it well, reconsider what I'm worth, if you plan to stay on earth, I'm my nature, don't mess with me. Well, she's sure been messing with us. A 5.2 earthquake hit the New Mexico border and seismic data spiked at the WIP nuclear site. There's no known fault in the center, but the fault is not in our stars, it's in ourselves. 
Same story at Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant in New York, where on July 6th there was a 2.5 earthquake, again along no known fault lines. As Hurricane Arthur bore down on the East Coast, Duke Energy's Brunswick Power Station in North Carolina and Dominion's two nuclear power plants at Surrey in Virginia went into emergency preparedness. And a once-in-decades hurricane approached Japan's southern islands with sustained winds of up to 123 miles an hour and gusts of up to 168 miles per hour, generating waves up to 46 feet high. And remember, nuclear power plants are put on the coasts of our oceans so that they can use the water to be cool, which means that any time there is a hurricane or a typhoon, let alone global warming... The danger at all nuclear facilities in their path increases. No, it's not nice to fool with Ma Nature. I'm Ma Nature! Don't mess with me! (laughs) We'll have our featured interview with USS Reagan veteran Steve Simmons in just a moment. But first, I want to remind you that Nuclear Hot Seat relies on your support to keep bringing you the anti-nuclear news every week. Donations are needed to cover bandwidth charges, security, travel expenses to cover stories, web hosting, and so much more. If you haven't yet donated, or if you'd like to help out again, or perhaps become a sustaining member, just go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the homepage, and click on the big red Donate button. Your assistance will go directly to helping me help you Keep up to date on all things anti-nuclear. This week, Nuclear Hot Seat is honored to present an extended interview with Steve Simmons, a 17-year Navy veteran who served on the USS Ronald Reagan. Steve was on board when the ship was called to do humanitarian aid work in Japan following the March 11, 2011 9.0 earthquake and tsunami. Steve is one of the 112 sailors currently suing Fukushima Daiichi power plant operator Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, for $1 billion to cover medical expenses for all armed service forces personnel whose health has been devastated by their exposure to Fukushima Daiichi's radiation. Steve and I spoke last week from his home in Utah. He readily admits that because of his illness, he had trouble remembering certain dates, names, and sequences of events. In a few places, details that eluded Steve during the interview will be added, all of it based on research. We started the interview by me asking Steve how he learned of the change of destination for the USS Reagan. After the earthquake and tsunami hit on March 11th, we got diverted and told that we weren't participating in the exercise anymore and that we were being relocated to provide humanitarian assistance to Japan. What, if anything unusual, were you aware of as the ship went into Japanese waters off the coast of Fukushima? We were told that we were going to be dealing with uh, radiation coming off of the power plant, the, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, because we have actually had to, I can't remember exact time frames, but we did have to secure uh, the ventilation at one point because of the contaminants and we were we also had to secure our water system on the rigging because we sucked up the contaminants into the water once it's in your water it feeds everything on that ship i mean it's your toilets your showers your water faucets your soda machines everything so we did have to secure water for i honestly couldn't tell you exactly how long it was for them to come out and say okay it's so-called safe and turn everything back on, which at this point, yeah, I'm not necessarily convinced it was safe. Uh, in fact, talking to a friend of mine who's dealing with issues almost identical to mine, who happened to be on a different ship, his job that he does, he was able to tell me that once once it's in the pipes, there's really nothing you can do without replacing pipes. You're not going to, you can't just filter it out of your pipes and call it good. So you were told to 
lock down the water system and the filtration system as you were going into Fukushima at the beginning of the accident? The exact time that the skipper came across and told us that they had to secure the water, I recall the events of it happening, um, but as far as the date, I'm not exactly sure of the date, the, the events of it happening, I vividly recall because I'd already been up that day, I'd already showered, brushed my teeth, gone had breakfast, drank a bunch of water and filled up my water bottle and gone to the office and when they had come across and told us that they had to secure the water because of the contaminants in it. And again, they try to do damage control and tell everybody that there's there's no health risks, there's no problems with it and everything like that. And, you know, I had some of my sailors who got all worked up and ran downstairs to medical to so just kind of touch base with them and verify that there was nothing wrong and that there was no problems or anything like that. And so I don't exactly recall... I wish I did. I wish I could recall the exact date and time of that particular event. Um, Research revealed that the orders to secure the water and ventilation took place on March 14, 2011, three days after the Fukushima Daiichi disaster began. When you arrived off the coast of Japan, that was March 12th of 2011. Correct. We arrived off the coast on the 12th and... I remember there was a time where the skipper had come across the 1MC or the ship's intercom system and one of the operating locations that we were trying to get to, um, where we were trying to operate from, there was question about how the ship should get there, which direction to sail. And if I remember correctly, we ended up sailing just directly south to that position to get on station and sailing south, it put us right into the nuclear plume. I had seen a deck log, a copy of the deck log that supposedly had a longitude and latitude of when we entered the, the plume, and it had the time of when we entered the plume and exited the plume, and we were sitting in this nuclear plume for over five hours, and there was a lot of question about, do we go through it, do we not go through it? Um, in fact, a friend of mine on the ship, within his job, he was purview to a brief that was conducted about whether we should go through it or should not go through it. And in fact, it was suggested that if you want to be safe and there's even no guarantee that you're safe, you may want to consider sailing back out to sea another three, 350 miles. And even then, they couldn't guarantee that we would be safe. But instead, they decided to make the call and sail through the plume. When you arrived off the coast of Fukushima, how far away did the ship anchor? I mean, it brings up an interesting point because honestly, what I've seen from photographs and what I heard while we were out there and what we're being told now is two different things. Pictures that you see suggest that we were pretty close proximity to Japan's coastline. And the deck log says one thing, like the, the coordinates, the lat long coordinates of the deck log suggest that we were 150 miles out to sea um, when we entered this nuclear plume. And to me, it's one of those things of where, what do you believe? Do you believe what people are telling you, saying that no, there's no chance that the Reagan ever, ever operated closer than 150 miles? or 150 nautical miles, or do you believe the photographs that clearly show the coastline of Japan in the background and the people that were on board who could clearly see the coastline from the ship? If I'm not mistaken, on the horizon, the human eye can only see approximately 17 miles on the horizon. So you're seeing the Ronald Reagan with the coast right there on the background. What side of that do you believe the photographs are what people are trying to, to say? When did you become aware and how did you become aware that perhaps there was a greater risk than you had been led to believe? I left the ship in September once we hit Hawaii and transferred out to Arlington. 
it was November time frame. I was driving into work and I had blacked out driving. And that's when I noticed something was wrong. I wasn't quite feeling myself. Just to give you this brief background prior to this deployment, I'd been healthy. In 2010, I had been doing P90X workouts, uh, insanity workouts. The summer of 2010, when we were in Hawaii for the ring pack exercises, on one particular day, him and I went and did a couple mile trail run. The next day, him and I hiked on Diamond Head. And the day after I hiked Diamond Head, I met up with some of the coworkers and we went and hiked uh, Stairway to Heaven. It's 3,922 stairs and you have to come back down the same way you went up. So I was in relatively good health and until November of 11 when I noticed something was wrong. What was the progression of symptoms and problems that you experienced starting with the blackout in September and moving on from there? The blackout was the first thing that I noticed and then the headache started to get worse. I started dealing with more GI issues and honestly at, at first I thought maybe I was just coming down with a stomach bug. I figured two, three days maybe it would go away. And when it didn't go away, uh, the fevers started up, the fevers kept getting higher. I would spike fevers as high as 102.9 and then by January of 12 I was the first time that I was hospitalized and the intern that was part of the t medical team that was in charge of my the case there I brought up the radiation exposure as a potential cause for everything because I, I tried to rack my brain as far as what could this be and so I brought up the radiation exposure and that in turn just kind of blew me off. And in fact, he told me that if, if it was radiation, uh, that I should have seen symptoms long before this. This is less than a year after. And he's telling me I should have seen symptoms long before that. I was honestly so frustrated. I told the intern that I wasn't a doctor, but he needed to go back to medical school because he was an idiot. Um, <laughs> And he was military. He was uh, at Walter Reed. So I told him that he needed to go back to med school because can you grab a patient from Chernobyl and before 20 years tell him that he should have developed symptoms and the cancer he developed 20 years later wasn't caused by the radiation exposure. That in turn sent me home with a so-called sinus infection. Three days later, I was readmitted to the hospital because my left nodes were swelling that during that hospitalization I was coming out of the restroom and according to my wife I had this blank stare on my face and that's when my legs buckled and the muscle weakness started to, to onset and ever since I've been dealing with the muscle weakness and it's been ascending from legs uh, trunk, arms, hands um, I lost about 20 to 25 pounds pretty rapidly, quite a bit of the muscle tone and uh, the mass that I did have. Um, I still have some tone today, but it's, it's useless. I can't really use the muscles much at all. I'm down to about 20 pounds of grip strength in my hands, which is barely functional. I have also deal with uh, neurogenic bladder now, so I do have to uh, catheterize um, every four hours in order to empty the bladder. Uh, the migraines still get worse. The fevers still come and go and they just keep calling it fever of unknown origin. My vitamin D is in the gutter. Um, they just keep calling it an unspecified vitamin D deficiency. Last summer, I ended up with second degree burns on my legs just from being out in the sun for three, maybe four hours. and. Before that, I had never dealt with any photosensitivity at all because of my heritage, so that had never been a concern. And nobody can figure it out. I've been getting this rashes that come and go. They'll go up my arms, my neck, around my eyes, back, stomach, legs. Um, I deal with tremors and 
spasms. And you're in a wheelchair. I am. And you also need medical care, according to your wife, medical care 24-7? Um, correct. My, my wife is my primary caregiver. There's days I don't even get out of bed. There's days where it's, you know, somebody has to help me bathe. It's certainly not easy, and it's not what anybody or what I would have expected. For a long time, I, I thought I was the only one. Um, I had no idea that there was other individuals that were even sick or dealing with ailments. It was probably the end of the end of 2012 by the time I had found out that there was anybody else that was sick because I would, I was contacting the some of the flight surgeons that were on the deployment with us asking if they heard of anybody. I was just trying to think of anything I could to, to find out what was going on because the doctors kept coming up with nothing and the doctors just wouldn't tell us anything. And during this time, were you bringing up the possibility of the radiation exposure to them? Uh, every time. You know, I've had doctors who, like that intern who, if it was radiation, you should have seen the symptoms long before this. I've had doctors tell me, if it's radiation, it's too early to see symptoms. I've had doctors tell me, well, if it is the radiation, there's really no way that I can tell because there was no internal and external monitoring done. So I can't tell you if it is. Um, I've had doctors tell me maybe you're better off not knowing what you're dealing with. Oh. Um, I've had doctors tell me that maybe this is a case of the comments, and we're like, what is that? And he's like, well, this is either a common presentation to something uncommon or an uncommon presentation to something common. And I'm just like, Thank you, Captain Obvious. You went to medical school to tell me this. And at that point is when I realized that I was quickly losing faith in, in medicine and realizing that doctors don't always have all the answers. And then, of course, the DOD kept peddling their same statement that they were peddling. I mean, word for word, the same things they told us on the Ronald Reagan about you could get more radiation more exposure from background radiation from one month supply of rock, sun, and soil. And it's like three years later to see that in text. And it's like, you know what? This is the exact same words that they told us while we were in the ship. And I was not even uh, on the ship to push that I believe button. And now I'm not. I mean, you can't have over 100 people or 200 people sick and one who has died this past April and to say that there is absolutely no health risk. And even if I want to sit, sit there and say, okay, I can get more background radiation from rock, sun, and soil from a month, well, we got that month's supply of background radiation. And what, you know, what did they say? Five hours of a plume? We were there on station for 30 days. What did we get in 30 days, if you do the math? And I'm like, that's ridiculous to say that there's no health risk to anybody. Let's shift this just slightly. Are you still considered to be active military, or has there been a separation? And if so, how did that take place? Um, I am uh, officially retired. It was honestly very bittersweet because I had never, this isn't the way I wanted to leave the military. I had actually had hopes of doing 30 plus years in the service. So to leave at almost just shy of 17 years was not my plan or my goal. After they continuously couldn't figure it out or didn't want to acknowledge that radiation was the cause, um, and they still don't want to acknowledge that. They started a medical board, um, it's called a medical evaluation board slash physical evaluation board, where they review everything that's going on. They review your medical record. They send you to medical appointments at the VA. The VA doctors write down their notes and send you on your way. They make a determination off of all that. Uh, if you have a diagnosis, sometimes that can be a whole lot easier and the process can be smoother than if you're just trying to go off symptoms alone, which in my case, that's really what they were going off of. 
person and they reviewed my case, they looked at it and said, okay, we're just going to send them out the door with nothing. Send them out the door with just a severance check, which that word didn't get back to me, and I'm glad it didn't. They looked at it one more time after that and decided that they were going to send me out the door with a 30% disability rating, which in the scheme of things, 30%, it's nothing. However, they were saying 30% uh, temporary disability retirement list, which meant every 18 months for the next five years, the case would get reviewed to see if there's changes. And if whatever doctor you go in front of, if they deem that things aren't as bad, they don't think that things are as bad as they are, or depending on whatever kind of recommendation they make, if you drop below 30%, then you're back out the door with nothing. Um, you lose everything. Um, we didn't accept the 30% rating, um, and that's on the DOD side. The VA side is totally separate. The VA rates everything that's ever happened to you throughout your, your military career. So we appealed the 30% rating and, and requested a formal board because I wanted to make sure that it was clear in the board that, or in my medical records that I am wheelchair dependent and that wheelchair dependency, loss of use of legs, even though you have them, is more than 30%. In fact, it's an automatic 100% rating. Uh, so we did appeal and then also added the bladder issues and they came back with 100% disability rating and permanently medically retired from the service as of April, the end of April of this year. So April 28th, I was officially retired. How did you find out that there were others who were suffering with odd changes in their health and debilitating illnesses after having been on the Reagan? I think it was December of 2012. My wife's sister had contacted her. her. My wife's sister lives in Texas, and she got a phone call, or a phone call or message or something, email or something, and said, hey, I've got this news article. You might want to take a look at it. And then she sent her this news article, and it had talked about, I think at that point, it was only maybe three individuals that had come forward that they were dealing with health issues or health concerns. So I had read the article, read the information about who their attorney was, and started jumping on the internet and seeing if I could find more information, you know, find more information about Paul, see if there's any contact information for him. When you say Paul, you mean Paul Gardner, the attorney? Correct, yes. So I found some contact information and, and reached out to them and kind of explained what was going on and that's when I started 13 I started talking to them kind of kind of under the radar behind the scenes kind of thing because I was really concerned that I was because I was still active duty I had some serious concerns and serious reservations about coming forward because of that fact even though I was never casting blame toward the military or toward the DOD or to the Navy or anything like that I was never casting blame or pointing any fingers at them but I still had reservations about it. And just because I was in that medical board process and couldn't jeopardize them getting this wild hair and saying, you know what, forget it, and just push me out the door with nothing. And then who's now unable to work in a wheelchair and health is continuously failing and a family of five, you know, a wife and three kids and two dogs. You know, I've got to think about what how can we take care of them? I kind of left things alone for a while until we were getting ladder into the latter part of 13 and things that kept getting worse. Doctors kept still blowing me off and finding out that there's more people that are sick. Finding out at one point there was some other individuals at Walter Reed who I never met. I heard, heard about them through a third party that was friends with one of their, an attorney that they had been talking to out there in the D.C. area, 
and I found out that they were there and they were sick and almost identical symptoms to what I was dealing with. But then because they were still active duty and because of their jobs, they were told to be quiet and next thing I know, they're who knows where they're at. Nobody's heard from them, nobody's seen them, so I'm guessing they've been moved somewhere else. And I think that was probably the tipping point for me that said, okay, something's got to be done. I know I have a buddy at Walter Reed right now who's same exact thing, very similar to what I'm dealing with, you know, maybe six months to a year behind on his symptoms. And the symptoms are at the point where his wife would call my wife and, and you know, my wife would explain, okay, this is what you could probably expect next and sure as anything that happens next. And the red tape that he's run into and <laughs> the fact that he is... <laughs> Him and I have both had doctors who have actively tried to convince us that there's physically nothing wrong and it's all psychological. And it's like, are you freaking kidding me? And he actually had a doctor openly admit and said, I've made a decision not to align myself with those doctors. And it's like, this is ridiculous. In fact, they, one particular doctor that he dealt with, who he didn't necessarily see eye to eye with, created a bunch of red tape. He's also in a wheelchair. And when he went to the clinic to get fitted for a wheelchair, this particular doctor happened to be there and told him that there's nothing wrong with him. It's all in his head and doesn't need a wheelchair. <laughs> and I actually used back channels and got him a wheelchair through other sources and other means because it was just ridiculous. And I'm like, this is uncalled for. Steve, when did you make the decision and actually join the lawsuit against TEPCO? I honestly don't recall. It was in 13 when I had started talking to Paul and I had sent him all my information and just kind of said, I don't really want my name brought forward. I just want to kind of keep things low key because like I mentioned earlier, I was really concerned and had some reservations about it. And the more and more that things just started to play out and the more red tape that people were dealing with and I was dealing with, I just couldn't take that any further. And I was just like, you know what? I'm not talking bad about the military. I'm not talking bad about the Navy. You know, this is all against TEPCO. It has nothing to do with the Navy. And that's when I made the decision that anybody who Paul wants me to talk to or would like for me to talk to, I'm more than willing to talk. I didn't really talk to much of anybody until after it's after September of 13, the end of September, actually, because WUSA 9 out there in D.C., they had posted a comment on their Facebook page about the government shutdown. If there's anybody, any of their viewers that were concerned with the government shutdown. And my wife posted a comment back on Facebook and shortly after that comment, she gets a, a message back that says, can we come out to your house and talk to you? We want to do a live shoot with you. I'm going into the night of the government shutdown. So they came out and did a story about the government shutdown and the concerns about the government shutdown. And when the reporter was done, she was talking to us and she's like, there's a whole lot more to your story. And I would like to tell that story. So she was Deborah Alfaron uh, to, to WUSA 9 was really the first reporter for me to take her best interest on what I had to say. She did a fantastic story, uh, broke it out into a couple different parts. And shortly after that, it was just the floodgates opened. CNN, who honestly was kind of disappointed with their interview. The interview itself went well. The content that they got was fantastic. And when they took it to the editing board and started cutting and chopping and everything else, and they cut out a ton of stuff and used what they wanted to. So the message of the story got lost. So it was kind of disappointing on that aspect, not just to myself and my, my wife, but to the other victims that are involved. It was disappointing to them because the message 
didn't get conveyed the way it should have. Sadly, I'm bad, though. I, I have a hard time remembering names. It's awful. And I've never had this issue until all this started. I used to be fantastic with names, but I'm so bad. Even if I meet somebody in person, I, I feel awful because a lot of times I can't remember who they are. You have a few other things going on right now, Steve, that I think take precedence over anything you need to feel over forgetting a person's <laughs> name. <laughs> yeah. We took a break for a few moments and then continued with, let's go back to the lawsuit. What do you hope will be accomplished by it? The biggest reason I joined the lawsuit was to really to help everybody else. There's so many of the sailors and marines that are you know, in their 20s or may have only had an opportunity to do two years, three years, four years, maybe five or six years in service, and then their health failed, and now they're out the door with nothing. No medical benefits, no retirement checks, no nothing. And these are the people that we need to help. As you grow in the Navy, within leadership, one of the things that a lot of the leaders and mentors that I had one of the things they always pounded into your brain was when it comes to sailors, it's first, last, and always. You take care of them. You take care of your sailors. And right now, we're not doing that. We're not taking care of our sailors. We're not taking care of those who made a sacrifice, who voluntarily raised their right hand to serve our nation and now they're suffering. There's no amount of money out there that could change this, that could make this better, that could take away the pain and the suffering of these people or replace lives that have been lost or potentially could still be lost. And we need to take care of them. We need to take care of their families. And it's, to me, it's one of the, hardest things to see, you know, your, your shipmates or your sailors and fellow Marines suffering because of lack of acknowledgement that there is even an issue. And I think one of the things that's so frustrating from on my piece is why is there so much effort going into hiding this issue? I mean, it feels like they're putting more effort into hiding the issue than they are to come out and honestly say, wow, there is an issue. This is what the issue is. So unfortunately, we didn't know the severity of the issue when it was happening. And that's, you know, one of the premises of the lawsuit is the fact that it's false information provided by TEPCO that started this chain of events where if they would have been open and honest out front and said, this is the issue, this is how bad it is, this is what we're dealing with here on the ground, I would have to assume and have to imagine that the decision makers would have done things a little differently, that you wouldn't take this huge aircraft carrier with your most important assets, and I'm not... When I refer to assets, I'm not talking about the ship itself or the millions of dollars worth of equipment or aircraft on board. I am talking about your sailors and marines that are on board because that's your number one asset. Without your sailors and your marines, the ship is dead in the water. It's not going anywhere. The aircraft aren't flying. Nothing's happening. So would you, if you knew the true severity of what was going on, would you take that carrier with approximately 5,500 sailors and marines on board and place it in a location that's going to bring harm to them and their lives, whether immediately or down the road? You know, it's, it's a little different than being a boots on ground. Yes, we're all following orders, but at the same time, if you want to acknowledge the fact that there was a threat, there was a, 
the threat that we were unaware of how bad it was. For me, I don't see any harm of acknowledging that. You're not admitting guilt. You're not saying we knew this was a problem and we did it anyways, or it was a problem, we did it and we do it again because that's what we do. But, and I'm not saying that wouldn't be the case because yes, there was a problem and absolutely would I volunteer my services again any day of the week. But to come out and say, look, we now realize how bad it was. What is it? They're deeming this the worst nuclear disaster in history. Then it's time to acknowledge the fact that, yeah, this is a problem. There is going to be some effects on human life. And let's start doing what we have to to take care of these people who stepped up and volunteered their service, their time, and their life in this country. And let's take care of them because that's what they did. You know, that's what the military does is they take care of those and they fight for those who either can't fight for themselves or are in dire needs. And that's what Japan was in. They were in dire needs and needed our help. So we answered that call. So it's time that, you know, we answer the call to help everybody else, to help take care of our own. And, uh, and that's, that was the biggest, that's the biggest thing for me. And that's why I stepped up and said, you know what, I, I'm going to bring my name forward to Paul. And because the more, the more you can add, the more power you can add to his case and the stronger you can make it the better shot he has of seeing some kind of resolution and getting resolution to make sure that folks are taken care of or their families are taken care of after if the worst case happens and some more folks pass. And, you know, I would honestly have to be naive to think that nobody else is going to pass away from this. Um, I, I think it's just a matter of time that there's going to be more lives lost you know, honestly, I I would be lying if I don't think every day if if I'm going to be next just because of how bad my health keeps going downhill and I either have okay days or I have really bad days. And so it, it, it's, I don't know. We took another little break then, and in coming back, I asked Steve a basic question I use at the end of all of my interviews, which is, is there anything else you would like to say that we haven't been able to cover yet? I can tell you one of the things that my wife and I have run into, aside from dealing with doctors who want to operate with blinders on, or agencies that want to operate with blinders on. We also run into, when we're trying to look for assistance with certain things, having a life-changing event that puts somebody in a wheelchair, there's a lot of things that change. Your housing needs change and everything else. And that's one of the things that we struggle with is figure out housing. We had heard about all these organizations out there that help wounded warriors build wheelchair accessible homes and everything and how great they are and building wheelchair accessible homes and adaptive homes for the wounded warriors and stuff. And so we reached out to so many of them and we keep getting the same answer from them is, sorry, no, we can't help you. Or you're not a boots on ground injury, you're not an amputee, so we can't help you. Or my wife would take your comments back about, sorry, your husband's not injured enough. And it's like, are you kidding me? To me, it's heartbreaking because if it's going to happen to me, it's going to happen to other people. Same other people that are going to be in similar situations down the road that are going to be looking for assistance where for us having to f focus on down payment for a house or building a house that wasn't 
something at the forefront of my mind. And when I got sick, you know, my wife quit working so that she could be my full-time caregiver and we exhausted our entire savings. So to hear people tell us, well, sorry, your husband's not injured enough or you're not an amputee, I'm sorry, I can't help you or whatever other excuse they give us. It's like, are you kidding? Just because I'm myself or others are not boots on ground, we still made the same sacrifice that those who are boots on ground made. We're still sacrificing either A, our mobility or our life for this country and to help our allies. And yet, because somebody in a suit wants to sit there and make decisions that say, well, this is the criteria of people we want to help. And you're shutting out a whole other group of people who have made the same sacrifices. Please don't get me wrong. I don't want to take away from anything that anybody has done with boots on ground because my hat's off to those, those guys, those sailors, Marines, and soldiers and airmen who have done it. But we're all in the same boat, whether we have prosthetics or we have our legs and can't use them. We're all in the same situation. We all need help. We all need assistance. And to for folks to open their minds and consider restructuring organizations to provide assistance to those who are going to need it. That would be one thing that I would say. But, you know, I'm just one person, and whether people listen to that or not, that's totally up to them. I wish I had answers. I wish I had the answers for my health. I wish I had the answers of how come we can't find organizations to help us and stuff like that, or to help all the other individuals that are dealing with issues too. But I don't, and I wish I did. That was Steve Simmons, formerly an ensign on the USS Ronald Reagan and a 17-year veteran of the U.S. Navy, retired. As for the lawsuit against TEPCO, there are currently 112 sailors represented in the case, and that number is expected to grow. The amount being asked on their behalf is $1 billion to cover medical costs for the sailors and Marines affected by Fukushima's radiation, but the amount realistically needs to be raised to create a medical fund of $3 billion. TEPCO, as can be expected, is challenging the case, and the next hearing is currently set for U.S. Federal Court in San Diego on August 19 at 1.30 p.m. This will be in the courtroom of Judge Janice Samaranto. I'll have more about what we can do to support the sailors and their lawsuit during today's final thought. A reminder that my ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond, is available on Amazon Kindle for about the same as the cost of a cup of Starbucks. Find out what it means to be only one mile from a nuclear reactor meltdown while it's happening. Lots of fun, lots of yucks, and maybe a thought or two to inspire in you along the way. Hey, John Stewart, we've got some good news. A really good contact has emerged in my quest to connect with you about becoming your nuclear pundit or special subject writer for The Daily Show. No telling where it might lead, but nice to know that the universe is responding. So, John, Booby, I plan on seeing you very soon and not through the screen of a TV or a computer. Here's today's final thought. That we as a country could put Steve Simmons and his cohorts in harm's way and then turn our back on them while putting down even the concept that radiation was a source of these catastrophic health breakdowns shows the depth to which the nuclear propagandists have gone in their efforts to convince everyone that all things nuclear are A-OK. Radiation is clearly the battleground. And the truth about it is being attacked, denigrated, belittled, and contradicted by the endlessly funded nuclear propaganda machine. My interview with Steve Simmons left me both heartsick and infuriated. The most powerful way I can imagine to convince others of the truth about radiation exposure and its devastating impact upon health is to have them listen to this interview. So we've got this little piece of propaganda, which in our case is another word for the truth. Let's use it. 
here's what I'm asking. Wherever you are in the United States, email a link to this interview to your local radio and TV news stations urging them to listen. If you know a veteran, send him or her the link. If you are a veteran and are connected with any veterans organizations, send them the link and see what they can do. Use this recording to agitate for support for these sailors. Do not stop. Yes, the VA is a mess, but what we're talking about here goes beyond that bureaucratic nightmare into what appears to be an intentional manipulation of information to deny treatment or even proper diagnosis. Then, as we get closer to the date of the hearing, if you are anywhere near San Diego, California, find out what you can do to support the case. You can contact the attorneys, Paul Gardner at P as in Paul, C as in Cat, G as in Garner, at GarnerLaw.com, or Charles Bonner at C Bonner, that's C like a cat, B as in boy, O-N-N-E-R, 799, at AOL.com. I will post links to these up on the website. When that hearing takes place, I would personally love to see one of those Vets on Harley groups come and bear witness en masse. So find out what you can do that will support these sailors as they try to get this tiny bit of justice for what has been done to them. And then go do it. Meanwhile, I promise to do my best to keep you informed, and I do plan to be in San Diego for the hearing. In closing... This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, July 8, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, NHK World, Fox News, Asahi Shimbun, our friend Iori Mochizuki and his brilliant blog, Fukushima Diary, the AP, NuclearNews.net, the U.S. Geological Survey, KOLD-TV, KRQE-TV, Power.ENG.com, WAMC-TV, Time, the Weather Channel, HuffingtonPost.com, the EPA, Reason.com, Counterpunch and Harvey Wasserman. Thank you, Harvey, for everything you do and have done. PanayNewsPhilippines.com and the fabulous and ever vigilant Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. Shout out with congratulations to Maureen Roy, who published the article Lessons from Fukushima in the summer 2014 issue of Macrobiotics Today magazine. We'll put a link to the magazine up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under episode 159. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV. We're now on three times a week, including a flashback random replay on Tuesdays. We're also on airprogressive.com. Our archive is available on iTunes. You can subscribe under podcasts, and you can also search the website, nuclearhotseat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halabi on Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed. You have my permission to reuse as long as proper attribution, website, and email are included. And for today's interview, that includes you in the paid media as well. Just give me credit. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep because we are all in the nuclear hot seat.